so with regard then to kind of the things that I focus on on my channel what's your ideas on kind of the nature of, of the human being as opposed not as opposed but in regards to what the core nature of us is I mean I, as I say I, I was always for years I was under the firm belief that we are our brain and that's it because you know there was no reason to, to suggest otherwise is, is that kind of where where you your beliefs are can you re rephrase the question one more time so effectively what do you think makes us us I only see evidence that it's our brain that makes us us like I and and our environment plays into how we process things and our genetics plays into that as well but you know watching people who develop um something like alzheimer's disease or um they have a malfunction that goes on in the brain um i would say they become a different person and so with that in mind i guess it's like sadly i think we are our brains like it, it, it's and it, i say sadly because it's like you said you could kind of couldn't deal with the fact that you weren't going to exist anymore one day and 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 you know that might mean that when your brain dies like you do cease to exist but I don't see evidence for us existing outside of our brains and a consciousness being able to exist outside of a brain. Mm. And the vast majority of, of the population would agree with you because they've never really had the necessity to, to look for it. I mean, why, why would you, especially at our age, you know, death isn't really something you think about. The only reason I think about it is because... You know, I was on the verge of being suicidal and, and thank God I was afraid of death because I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. It was only that fear that stopped me from doing it. Um, have, have you ever seen any um, of the research done on, on various anomalous experience? I mean, you've got the standard, everyone knows the near-death experience, for example. Um, I've looked into it a little bit, not much, but like, I just think when I hear examples of like near-death experiences where they think people claim that their consciousness went on after they they like ha kind of died you know because they didn't really die because they came back to life or whatever um i would say that there there might be chemical explanations for that i wouldn't necessarily automatically take a spiritual explanation for those mm. claims yeah and that's just the same way I went to look at it as well the only problem I found is when there started to be examples of something called you probably wouldn't have heard of it apparently non apparently non-physical veridical perception nope, which is it. where which is where people leave their bodies allegedly and are able to see things out with you know outside of their normal range of where the natural sense would be some people see things in different rooms some people see things in different countries if a friend or something is over there they can go and and things like that I mean one could always claim these kind of things are anecdotal which they are in their very small numbers but the problem is now that we have so many examples of these and there are so many other different phenomena that that tie into it but this is kind of one of the strongest in my opinion you know we have hundreds of, of documented cases now of third-party confirmed apparently non-physical veridical perceptions um, which it's, it's certainly something worth looking into because this is kind of the sort of thing that made me begin to shift and it was difficult to begin with to say this wasn't just hallucinatory because as, uh, you know as, as you say there are certainly for the vast vast majority of these experiences there are chemical explanations there are um, hypoxia based explanations there are electrical activity based explanations that can be reasonably put forward but when it comes to these perceptions that of, of you know, verified observations when they shouldn't have been possible uh, in the hundreds this is where I start to think maybe this is something worth looking into a little bit more I think 
it can be interesting and entertaining to look into a little bit more. I just think that I'd be hesitant to automatically assign a spiritual explanation for those things. And I'm not saying that I, again, I don't positively know that nothing outside of this life exists. Like, I can't know that. I just, I guess I, I took the spiritual explanation from my, let's see, in earlier in my life, I took the spiritual explanation for everything very easily without looking into the scientific explanations for things. And because that was detrimental to me. I guess for me personally, like I would have a hard time um, accepting, and maybe that's a bias there, but accepting a spiritual explanation for those experiences because I I wonder if, if that's just us trying to cope with the fact that we're not going to live forever and like it's it's more of a us dealing with our fear of our own demise and it, it's that not somewhat begging the question that that is the case what do you mean uh, assuming that these kind of things are a way of us mentally or emotionally coping with the fact that we will no longer continue to exist after death that's presupposing that that's the case um, See, whereas I would argue that the data is suggesting otherwise now. How does the data suggest otherwise? That would take a while. <laughs> there are a lot of... Have you ever heard of the Virginia University's uh, um, Division of Perceptual Studies? No. There are, there are a group of, of researchers who are researching around various different things. Um, Near-death experiences, of course, are, uh, apparent... Um, spontaneous reincarnation memories, something I don't know enough about, I haven't really looked into it much um, there are different kind of philosophies now circling around panpsychism and, and idealism and different things like that um, and there is there's a lot of data for these different, I mean even things like Psy, which I would have told you is complete nonsense when you look at the statistics of it, there are very strong statistical significances between the data that's being picked up and it's just Conglomerating them all together, it, it, you know, it's taken me years looking through it to really get a grip of it. But the date, the, there is data there that is beginning to suggest that maybe the, the standard materialistic paradigm that we have may not be the be-all and end-all of, of what it is. And it's just, it could be that I, I'm being biased. I try to eliminate as much as that as I possibly can mm -hmm. because of my fear of death. You know, I, I don't dismiss that that's a factor. Um, and it could also be for these other researchers, but when you listen to them and you look at their, I mean, these, this division of perceptual studies has published hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of peer-reviewed journals in different, um, art, in different journals, and when you really read it and try to be as open as possible without those biases in place, the data to me, to me anyway, really does seem to suggest that maybe the brain creation of consciousness theory, which we have no idea how that can happen anyway but it, it's assumed that that might not be a case i think it's more the brain acts as a kind of a filter for some form of consciousness that we don't have a mechanism for yet that we don't understand but there is enough re record of these experiences that have been verified and have been repeated you know in the millions i mean these near-death experiences they reckon somewhere or they estimate somewhere up to 20 percent of the population has, has had something like this that's a billion people now, it kind of takes it out of the realm of anecdotal, <laughs> although, of course, not all of them have been recorded. And mm -hmm. it's just, just, there seems to be experiences that are not explainable, taking the pres presupposition that the brain creates consciousness. And the only way we can really say that's not the case is to say either these experiences don't happen, um, there are faulty memories, or there is some kind of materialistic mechanism we don't understand yet. Although, getting into that kind of argument, which is reasonable, there's again you know the data it has on it is too much to go into but is against that kind of explanation in my opinion mm -hmm. yeah i hear what you're saying it's just to me it would be 
very odd if the brain was more of a filter, but then our brains, like when I've studied the brain and looked at how we process our memories and how we, like how cognitive biases and heuristics work, it'd be, it, it would be really odd to me if we were like souls or spirits and then our, an, or like our consciousness was separate from our brains, but then we have all these misfirings that happen because of our brains, like, and our misinterpretations of reality that happen because our brains are not really set up to um, see things objectively. And also our brains are not set up to be rational really either because we have heuristics where we kind of use all these mental shortcuts to make sense of our reality, which then is sometimes useful for like quick decision making, but it can be um, not beneficial to us or counterproductive um, when it comes to trying to <clears throat> analyze information rationally or objectively. Like, do you get what I'm saying? Kind of, it's it would be odd to me that our brains just hold our consciousness, but then we have all these um, patterns that we can see in the brain that explain why, why and how we think the way that we do. I don't think it explains why and how. I think they're just what's called neural correlates. And they're very strong neural correlates. We can say that when we see this in the brain, we know that this is the effect. What we can't then say is that we see this effect, so this part of the brain causes that feeling. Because it, it does sound incredibly strange and incredibly far-fetched at first glance, but it would because you haven't looked at this data. And, you know, I haven't looked at the data that you've looked at for um, going against Christianity, so I can't understand exactly your position on that but you know to me it seems just as far-fetched to suggest that ultimately unconscious matter which is the foundation of, of everything atoms and, and protons neutrons quarks that are arranged in a certain way to form neurons and billions and billions of those together all by their nature unconscious matter add an electrical charge and some chemical makeups all of which are also comprised of these unconscious balls of matter can then suddenly give rise through a process one could only really describe as magic into a conscious experience i mean it'd be like a good good example is bernard you know bernardo castrop no no everybody that you've he, mentioned i'm like nope never heard of him <laughs> he, he's a philosopher of mind he's he um pushes an idea called idealism which is that everything's conscious and, and the matter i'm probably absolutely butchering is, is his theory but it's that um, matter is essentially a present a presentation of consciousness matter is what consciousness looks like from the perspective of a conscious experiencer mm -hmm. and don't ask me to explain it because it, it bends my head just saying that but um he, he puts it like this if you have um a bunch of taps because the way our neurons work is they um if they're active they have what's called an, an action potential which is where they then fire the signal across a synapse to another neuron so effectively it's a binary system on or off you can think of that as a bunch of taps if you have millions and millions and billions and trillions of taps the same number as we have with um, the number of neurons in our brain it'd have to be the size of probably the usa <laughs> the network of taps turning one on one off one on one off and then would you expect that to suddenly become conscious knowing that these were just taps yeah i mean that's it's fascinating to think about it is. i like it's definitely like a new idea for me to think about i think about things very deeply <laughs> so do i i i just haven't thought about the brain in that way and i think that's the part of me there is a part of me that you know really is agnostic about there being something out there i like i mean it when i say i am an agnostic atheist i i i don't fully disregard any 
like possibility that there could be more to life, but I can't just also hear that information and go, oh yeah, then we must no, you have shouldn't. a soul or, that's, or that's the worst thing you can possibly do. There must do. be an afterlife. I, I've thought about simulation theory quite a lot. Like I've thought, you know, that, and for people listening who don't know what simulation theory is, it's like it's complex. But, yeah, <laughs> but basically, um, you know, th we're getting so good at creating virtual reality and so good at technology that the chances that we are going to create a virtual a virtual reality that's indistinguishable from reality the chances are very high that we're going to create something like that but then basically a lot of philosophers think that there's a high chance that we're already in a virtual reality and um i think that's really cool to think about and like it kind of um it it's kind of a fun explanation for the unexplainable for me because i'm like oh well maybe this is a creation of of other humans in another reality i don't know but um i don't know i brought that up just to say that like i do think that there could be something more and i do like to think about those ideas but i wouldn't know what that something is and i don't think it would be anything like a god in the sen in the terms that we use in religion so i think that there could be something outside of our consciousness or something that drives our consciousness but like who's to say what that is like um I, I would like to look at the data that you talked about about the near death experiences because I like I'd like to know if I could see any um, biases in the research or if maybe there's a bias on my end of like I've gone further into the naturalist mindset than I maybe even intended to and I'm it's not that I'm assigning that that's a negative thing because I think whatever way you can get through life and feel at peace and feel happy is fine like as long as you're not hurting other people with your your ideas right mm. yeah and you know absolutely if you look at the data there will be biases on your side and on the researchers side because the researchers are human and, and so are we mm -hmm. it's difficult to really kind of drop all those biases initially because they're so built into us I mean, mm -hmm. my main bias was the fear of death, and I'm aware that that's probably tainted a, f a lot of my views in some way, but I try to negate that as much as I possibly can by being as objective as possible. And I mean, the, the, uh, initially when you say the simulation theory, to me that seems a big, big stretch to say that that could be the case. But that's I don't know, I, I've, I've never looked at it. You know, it, at the end of the day, science should be this. Here's a hypothesis. Here's another hypothesis that challenges it. Which one has the most data to support it? In other words, which is the most parsimonious explanation? To me, it's that brain is not the, the creator of consciousness and that it acts as a filter to something we don't know. Um, to me, the, the materialistic model is, is too limited to the data that we now have. I could be very wrong. But I think as well to, to assume that now, you know, we've reached the peak of, of scientific discovery is it's a ridiculous thing to think and many people do think that because you know the, the size and the complexity of the universe is so vast we can only see and measure something like 0.05 percent of everything in, in the visible light spectrum everything or that's what we can see but everything we can measure is within that that band of electromagnetic radiation and even that band is so tiny in comparison to what is out there mm -hmm. to suggest we understand anything about you know the human brain which is the most incredible piece of engineering nature has ever produced to say that we could understand completely how that works by correlates alone is ridiculous you know especially mm -hmm. with the advent of quantum mechanics which is which has turned everything on its on its head i mean no one has a clue what that's what that stuff's doing at that level mm -hmm. but i mean it's nice to think of these big questions i mean you know materialism has been incredibly helpful incredibly helpful and it's got us everything that we've got now but when it comes to these big questions you know life after death or 
um, the nature of, of reality and the, if there's a creator or not. These things are kind of beyond our capabilities right now, especially in science, which is limited to measuring the physical. And yeah. that's where we start to rely on philosophy and, and different things like that. But I, I think the data is now suggesting that there is some sort of non-physical, non-local consciousness, na the nature of which we haven't got a clue about yet. Hmm. But yeah, have, have a look at some of the some of the research. It'd be interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah, I I, I, I think so too, for sure. Um... And you know, don't don't take my my word on it that I'm saying it's I think it's spiritually based because I only came to that conclusion from a lot of time and a lot of reading of this stuff. You know, I didn't just assume it was going to be a spiritual explanation. I looked at both sides, along you know for a long time. And I spoke to I've spoken to a lot of people on this podcast themselves who did the research. So it, it takes a you know a very open mind and a very critical review of both sides of the argument to really find the strength and which which way it lays. Yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting to look through. I definitely don't have a fear of death and not existing anymore. So it, it'll it be interesting to see if I come to a similar conclusion to you, uh, like in my in looking at it for myself. Um, because for me, I, I actually get peace out of the idea of not existing anymore. Like I... I think the prospect of living forever sounds terrible. Like, I think I like that life has an end point and that's kind of what makes it special. Um, but I also get where you're coming from in that fear, like, because like, I can't understand what it would be like to not exist anymore. So there's kind of that fear of the unknown there, but. I mean, in terms of living forever, it is a terrifying thought to live forever and ever, but that's again putting across a strong presupposition, and that's presupposing that the nature of life after it's left, say, the physical realm, mm -hmm. that time is experienced in the same way. Right. And many people who have had these experiences, either outside of their body or in near-death situations, have said that time is nothing like what it is here, and it's impossible to explain. But it's not it's not they never have that fear of living forever because it's just that time isn't the same and it's I don't know, you can't imagine what it must be like to live outside of time mm -hmm. i mean even thinking about it gives you a headache it's like trying to imagine a new color you, know, you can't right so yes it would be absolutely terrifying to live forever assuming that time is exactly as we experience it here and another thing you said which is interesting is that um we can't imagine what it's like to never be conscious again. And my argument to that is that it's impossible to ever not be conscious. And this is kind of the way, I suppose, my idea of logic works. I mean, what triggered my anxiety initially was I fainted in a science lesson. My experience of that was feeling like shit for a couple of seconds. Um, then there wasn't an experience of not being conscious, there was just an experience of suddenly being awake on the floor. And it's just, you know, even with deep sleep, we're, we, our experience of deep sleep is being awake, having a dream, having another dream, and then waking up. That period of deep sleep isn't an experience. So how then, you know, our only experience of life has ever, has only ever been consciousness. And since consciousness exists for us now, and assuming that non-consciousness can never be experienced as an experience, when death comes, we can only ever, as we're conscious now, we can only ever be conscious. Because it's not possible to be aware of not being conscious. And you know, this is how my mind works, and it's, it's a pain to sleep at night, because <laughs> it doesn't shut up. But it's, 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 it's a very strange thing to think about. But it's yeah. also, it's logically... Cool. I, it's yeah. cool to think about. Mm. Yeah, and I just don't think... I think it's it's logically impossible to ever not be conscious for eternity. I think we can only ever be conscious, because if we if, if that was the case, we wouldn't be conscious to begin with. I'm not sure I follow that part of it. No, though. no, no. Have you ever experienced not being conscious? Um... I've had experiences where I would explain... Like, like you said, with sleeping... Like where I would explain 
it to myself as, oh, I must have been asleep, right? Because I, I don't remember what happened in between closing my eyes at night and waking up in the morning. So that's how I would explain it to myself. But you're right, you can't experience it. You just... You can't experience you ex- not experiencing. You explain, it to your, you explain to yourself that it happened, but you can't prove it either, right? Like, that's actually really fucking trippy to think about. Excuse my <laughs> language, but like, like, I can't prove that I was sleeping that whole time. That's yeah, really the only- weird. The only clue of ever being not, you know, ever being in a state of non-experience is by either looking at the clock and seeing that five minutes has, has passed, or you know, the change of night to day. But that that's never that period of deep sleep or unconsciousness is never an experience. It's only, it, I mean, it's it's nothing. It's, it's it's never in our experience. So I don't see how it can be any different with death. Hmm. You know, millions and billions of years could elapse, but. To us, if we're conscious at one moment, how can we ever not be conscious f- for the rest of time? Mm-hmm. Because otherwise we'd never have been conscious to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going down the rabbit hole with you. I'm like thinking, because, okay, something you said earlier, and I'll talk about it since we're in an open-minded space here and I'm trying to just yeah. not be... We, we, um, we did begin with atheism, but we've kind of moved on. Yeah, well, I mean, what is, there, what is there to say about atheism? Other, That's what I mean. It's like, it's a lack of belief in God. It's not too interesting. There's a lot of atheist content that you, you can make interesting because you're responding to a religious idea or you're exploring a, a philosophical idea. But atheism in itself is boring. It's like, I don't believe in any gods so far. And, you know, I'm waiting for evidence to believe in a god. But you have to move on to to other stuff because there's not there's not much else to it. And you could talk about the activism end of things, like we talked about earlier. But there's not a whole lot to it, and that's that's what I mean about the label. It's like it's almost meaningless. Yeah, I prefer just to say what what do you believe in terms of God, and then let them explain what they believe, and then fine, we'll work off of that. You know, I don't need to think of you as an atheist or a theist or whatever. Just whatever you believe. Mm-hmm that's what we'll talk about right yeah but anyway i was going to kind of go down the rabbit hole with you and say there are times and i i wouldn't know what the scientific explanation for this would be but maybe there is one and maybe i can look into it um but there are times where i have a feeling or like an experience and i feel like i've lived life before like deja vu yeah and i'm like have I been here before? Like, it, like, and is that just some sort of misfire in the brain, or is like, like what you're saying? Like, is, yeah, I mean, there is are there so a many, spiritual element to that? There, there are so many experiences like that that you know scientists will, will assume we understand, but we don't. I mean, deja vu. There's you know one of the theories that we're experiencing multiple realities at the same time, just in slightly different ways. So we are we are experiencing something at the same time, and that feeds back. Other experience, you know, other other experience, other um, explanations say something like um, there's a delay in in some sort of synaptical passing over of of um, firing electrons or something like that. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at that for a long time, mm-hmm. but we don't know. I mean, that could all completely be physiological. It might not be, but the, you know, we don't know. So we should keep an open mind. I mean, they now think there's how many different um, dimensions which we we don't understand the nature of i think they said there's 11 or something how can they come to that conclusion and who's they i don't know yeah i don't know i mean i know yeah it's it's i mean these things you you can't really take if you don't work in that field you can't really have an opinion on it of it because you don't know the research that's been going on but yeah i mean another good interesting thing to think about is um when we were talking about the simulation theory is the, is the idea of what constitutes reality anyway, because reality is only as real as our brain is able to, f- f- well, I suppose filter in um, inputs it gets. You know, So our experience of, of this microphone is light bouncing off of it into our retina, 
which is then processed, flipped upside down and projected to us as this. But that's not the reality. The reality is the information that's contained within those rays of light. And this is the reality as far as our brain can translate that information. So effectively everything that we see and touch and smell and hear is only our brain's conception of reality, it's not reality itself. Mm -hmm. And depending on how limited our brain is, we can only get a very limited sense of what real, what is real. Because it's not, it's only as real as our brain can, is wired to, to project it, if that makes sense. So we've got no idea what the nature of reality is, yeah. only what our brain shows us. And so using measurements based off of those observations mm -hmm. is, only, is only observing what our brain is projecting to us as real, not of reality itself. Which is, to me, information. Right. What it looks like, what it smells like, what it sounds like, God knows. But, you know, there are bigger things going on that it bends my head to really try and imagine. Yeah. Well, and... and See, that's where I'm like, I don't know why or what, like why we would be experiencing different realities as you were talking about a couple minutes ago, or like what any of this would mean if there's more going on. Because when you, when you look at the brain and you, you look at like mental health problems, um, they do have what we would call like an inner, a lot, like I'm being too general here. Let me be more specific. <sighs> when you're depressed and you have cognitive distortions and you interpret reality that like nothing will ever get better and um, my life is terrible and it's going to stay that way, it's not an accurate interpretation of reality, but it's like, why would, why would that occur if we're some sort, sort of consciousness or spirit, or if we are more than just our brains, like, why would why we- Why does it have that effect? Yeah, why would we experience reality in that way due to something that's going on in our brains, due, due to something that's going on chemi chemically with us? Chemically, yeah. If you open up a radio and you take out a, a, um, a certain component and the sound as a result, the sound that comes out of the radio is distorted or is, is very bassy or very trebly or whatever, does that mean that that component caused that sound? Or does it mean that the way that co that component was able to filter the sound has been changed? I don't know. Because radio receives radio waves, and the, co the components within the motherboard of that radio translates it into sound energy, which is given to us as sound. <laughs> of course, it's sound energy. But if you mess around with some of the capacitors, or you take a hammer and wang the hell out of that radio, the sound comes out distorted and horrible, or it stops completely. Why can't that be the same of the brain? If you change something of the brain, it's not changing consciousness itself, it's changing the way that consciousness is filtered and expressed. Hmm. That's fascinating. See, this, this is why I always go back to people that say there's no evidence to suggest that consciousness is external of the brain. They list all the evidence. You hit your head, you lose consciousness, or you become fuzzy. As you say, Alzheimer's takes effect. I mean, there's another aspect of that. Remind me to tell you, because that's, that's a fascinating one as well. But Alzheimer's takes effect. That changes the brain. Your brain begins to disintegrate, and your personality changes. Um, we know that. Um, if you take psychoactive drugs, it changes your experience completely. We know that. That's evidence that the brain suggests... That's evidence to suggest that the brain creates consciousness, no doubt, and strong evidence as well. But it could also be evidence that the brain acts as a filter to an equal level of, of certainty. Because if you do all that as well to the brain, which is a filter, of course it's going to change the way the information or the consciousness is filtered. And to me, the filter theory suggests it's more compatible with what we experience because we also have to take into consideration these anomalous experiences that can't be explained by the brain creating it. Whereas all the evidence of the brain creating it can also be attributed to the brain filtering it, as far as I see it. And I'll give you, um, to go back to the Alzheimer's thing, one other fascinating thing that leads me to believe that there's something more. 
Have you ever heard of terminal lucidity? Or it's now called paradoxical lucidity. No. So, commonly reported in Alzheimer's, but other things as well. Currently inexplicable medically. As the brain deteriorates, of course, it causes um, loss of lucid experience. People don't know who you are at the bedside. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they are. They get all confused and hallucinatory and whatever. And then, usually days or even minutes before the moment of death, they suddenly become wide awake and they know exactly where they are. They know everybody. They know exactly what's going on, as if talking to us now. Perfectly lucid. Now, how can that be in a brain that's been degraded for so long and has worn away and worn away, apparently losing all neural function, and then suddenly gains complete clarity, even though that degradation has already taken place? And this has been reported uh, a number of times. And it's, it can't be explained through medical means at the moment, not to say it won't be, but at the moment there's no explanation. And people posit the hypothesis that it could be. As the brain is becoming so damaged, the consciousness, the ability for the consciousness to be filtered through it is becoming less so, and so it's experienced more as pure consciousness, unfiltered as it naturally is. And some people say it's the soul separating, but to me it's, it's an analogy of the same thing. And it's, it's effectively becoming less encumbered by that dying brain and so it's becoming more lucid hmm. that's, that's an experience which is really interesting to me because it defies any kind of natural explanation at the moment not to say it won't ever why do you think if consciousness were to be separate from the brain why do you think we, the brain would be what holds consciousness and like how does Like, how does evolution and scientific explanations for reality, like, how do you how do you take those things into account using your worldview? So you have kind of like a, a open mind to a spiritual reality. So like, so why? Yeah. Why? why? Yeah. I don't know. Um, we can only really speculate. I mean, the, the main idea is that. People say God, people say it's it's a, a field of consciousness, and <laughs> we're going to have to go even deeper. Um, Don't worry about it, I mean, it's fine. <laughs> so, imagine that, and this is just, this is one idea, imagine that consciousness is like a body of water. Okay. There's different analogies, we'll say like the ocean. Each person is an expression of that consciousness in physical form, in an apparent separate form. Mm -hmm. So you've got the sea. And each one of us would be a wave in the ocean. Mm -hmm. On their own, they've got distinct boundaries. You can see, and you'd say that that's a wave. That's a separate wave. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, that wave consists of just the ocean in a different expression of itself. So some people think that consciousness, or that we are an expression of consciousness. Um, Bernardo Kastrup says it's a sort of a disassociation. And the reason they think that that happens is for consciousness to learn what it's like to be an individual and that can only achieve that by physical means i mean anybody that denies that evolution is is effectively true is to me i, I don't see how you could think that i mean I, i'm not a new earth the new earth creation whatever the hell they Young call earth them e yeah. yeah evolution is true as mm -hmm. far as anybody can reasonably say the ultimate picture of why that happens, I have no idea. But perhaps nature devises these bodies and these brains as a means of experiencing what it's like to be individuals at different capacities of experience. I mean, the human brain is, of course, the most advanced, and we can experience the most, I suppose, accurate form. Although we can't even really say that. But we, experience, we can experience it as what it's like to be human and we have the ability to think and to be self-aware mm -hmm. and to develop these emotional relationships and these em empathy um, whereas as, as, a, as a dog one could go and, and learn what it's like to be unconditionally loving or yeah, this is complete speculation we have no idea but to me it's all about learning and, it, and it's whether God learning through us or the ultimate consciousness or, or reality learning what it is to be itself through through, yeah. So, through so you would include animals maybe in this philosophy as well, like, um, 
like maybe there's a consciousness that would be quite terrible if there is a consciousness out there that wants to experience what it would be like to be a factory farmed animal for example like like uh, like just going with a theory like that we're all part of one greater consciousness even with including non-human animals like um whether it's whether it's an idea of wanting to experience certain things mm-hmm. or whether it's just that evolution and nature began and has followed its natural cycle and consciousness is now because nature would be an expression of that consciousness because consciousness would essentially be the foundation and so nature is is consciousness in a different form in a material form so everything that goes on is is consciousness so it's integrally linked it's just whether it what to what level of experience it has you know um factory farmed animals would be consciousness it it just wouldn't be self-aware as far as we can see it wouldn't be self-aware human level consciousness yeah but but it's still i I think animals are a lot more self-aware than we give them credit for like i think a lot of people are undereducated, and we don't have to go down the vegan rabbit hole right now but i'm just just for the sake of uh, contributing to this part of the conversation like there are dogs that are given buttons for like human like an english the english language like to speak and obviously they don't have the vocal cords just to speak in english but if they're given buttons like let's say like 50 buttons to create sentences with dogs are able to start to even ask why questions like or like where questions like I, I've watched this one dog that asks, you know, they ask um, their dog parent, like, where do you go to the bathroom? And the dog, it, it seems like the dog is responding to the dog parent in conversation. And so that makes me think, well, if a dog can respond and have why questions and where questions and um, be able to articulate with button using buttons, of course, um, that they want to go outside or go for a walk or lay lay down or whatever. Then an animal like a cow or a pig with the same amount of intelligence, if they were given the opportunity to speak using a similar technology or the same technology, they might be able to. And it makes me think that they do have a Maybe not the same level of consciousness as us, but I also just wonder if they just don't have the ability to speak the same same language yeah. and they do have similar thoughts and maybe haven't been able to develop quite as far as we have. Um, but maybe if they're given the tools, they could. Yeah. And I'm sure anybody that has a dog or a cat or has been really in close contact with any animal, if you look into that animal's eyes, there's no doubt that they know what's going on in there. You know, they've got... I mean, these, these biblical literalists that say animals are for humans, they don't have souls. Look into a dog's eyes and tell me that. You know, I've got two little schnauzers. You know, you can't beat the friendship of a dog and the genuine connectedness with a dog. You know, if there was ever connections between souls, it'd be, be between a dog and a human. The connection is so close and it's unconditional. But it comes back to the question: Why, why would consciousness want to experience itself as a neglected animal? Yeah, yeah. I don't. It, and and, I, I don't and know. also, we. I guess because I've studied human development, it's like we are just so much of a product of our environment. Like if if you were to take the same person with the same genetic makeup and put them in two different environments, they would become two different people. And so to me, that seems like a a brain collecting information or data on how to best exist in that reality because like we've evolved to survive. Um, And so it's like, how would a spiritual consciousness play into that? Well, don't don't forget, if if my world worldview is true, let's assume for a moment that it is, okay. it'd be work. It'd be it would only be able to experience through that brain, mm-hmm. and we know through you know neural plasticity that the brain changes. 
mm-hmm. as it develops to new situations. So of course, the experience will be dependent on how that brain grows and how it develops. But again, that's correlational. That doesn't dis- that doesn't show that it produces the experience. The the, the f- conscious aware. I mean, <laughs> um, how best? If we look at consciousness as in like a sky, and thoughts, and ideas and emotions as clouds. Behind all experience, or, or sorry, behind all emotions, behind all thoughts there is something that's aware that it's having those thoughts. You know, people believe that we are our minds. But if you look at the mind as, as, as thoughts and emotions, there's always an awareness behind that, watching it, an observer. You know, within the sky there's clouds, but behind the clouds there's just empty sky, empty awareness. And that's what I think consciousness is, is just awareness. Not awareness of anything in particular, but awareness. And the brain, working through the brain, it has the ability to be aware of material things. And as one develops in a certain culture, the brain, like, you know, kids are like sponges. They, they, the brain changes according to the experiences we have. And that's the experience that consciousness is in the background of. You know, consciousness hasn't changed since we were two years old and it won't change to when we're 80. That core awareness of being will still be there. Our experiences, the content of that consciousness might be different and we might mature and grow, but that awareness is always there. Just just that thing that's aware of what's happening. And that, that's what I think consciousness is, and I think the brain filters the experience of that so that it can know what it's what it is to be physical. Mm. I'm probably not the right bloke to talk to about this sort of thing because I'm only kind of knowing what I've seen. It, yeah, people that have spent their it just lives makes me have more questions. Like, and and you can tell me when to stop with the questions. But okay, now I'm wondering, going with your worldview, what would be the point? I guess I would just have a lot of why questions. Like, what would be the point of all the things about us that we do unconsciously? Like, there are so many things that other people perceive about me that I have no that I'm not even aware of, but I do them unconsciously. And to me, life makes sense if I say, well, I have a brain that does things unconsciously and there are some scientific explanations for some of those things that I've found and some things that I'm still learning about. But like, if I were to use like a, if I were to look at those things through like a spiritual lens, I don't know how I would make sense of just these random kind of attributes. Impulses. Yeah. So the mind is in two layers, conscious and unconscious. It's like a, it's like an iceberg. The conscious mind is maybe that big. Then under the surface of the water, the rest of the iceberg is probably the size of a country. And that's, you know, the unconscious mind is the main driving force but of, of our actions. Our consciousness is only, our conscious mind is only a tiny percentage. Mm-hmm. So we know that a lot of what we do is unconscious, it's habitual. So why would we attribute that to the creation of the brain as opposed to not? How, how what's, you say you saw, you've seen scientific data to suggest that it's brain created. So what, what data is that? Let me try to think of an example. Um, so, okay, let's say grinding your teeth. Like if you grind your teeth in your sleep, mm. th- like there, there would be a physical and scientific explanation for why you do that. But what would be the spiritual reason for why you would go through some or do something unconsciously that would be kind of detrimental to you or if not detrimental mm. at least not beneficial to you well it depends on how the brain's wired consciousness has no control as far as i'm concerned once it's in once it's connected to that brain consciousness is just along for the ride and it's it's the brain that I determines see. you know otherwise evolution would be pointless because the consciousness wouldn't need a body it would just be itself right. 
right. and then it wouldn't be able to experience what it is to be physical with these restrictions you know right so and that's you know, kind of the problem i see with simulation theory too it's like if we're simulated then like what's the point of like yeah uh you know starting off as babies we could just like simulate well yeah, i guess jump. all of our memories could be simulated as well you could just we could all be kings and queens right and right live happily forever yeah and to, to me as well the idea of of death being so final to me makes no sense as to the why question either because ultimately if if death is inevitable for everybody and people say that death gives life its meaning because it's temporary the way I see it, if everything is going to die, including the universe itself, what does it what what, what does it matter? Right. We can we can make our life, or we can make the lives of our children better by living well and and being happy. Great, and then the children are happy and they've got a better life all for it, and so will their children and their friends and everyone they meet. But they're all going to die as well. Right. I and I the last, totally yeah, know the, what you're talking about. I can totally yeah. relate to these thoughts. In, in the sense that I've had these thoughts when I've been depressed as well, where it's like, okay, all of this, like nihilism mixed with depression is like horrifying. Like if you have some something chemically going on with you where you you are just down and out in life and then you also think of like this kind of dark philosophy of just nothing matters, it is, it is hell on earth, for sure. It is. And, you know, depression gives a good example as to the idea that chemicals create this experience because depression and anxiety are essentially... I mean, I'm sure you understand how it works in the brain. I mean, I had to to survive. I had to learn what was going on. So your brain secretes a chemical called serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, which is used to carry neuronal impulses across synapses. And each synapse releases... This is mainly for the audience who don't know the new. But the uh, brains, when they release... Um, when neurons release this chemical in anxiety there isn't enough of it being sustained within the synapses which is why they give um, SSRIs drugs which is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors to keep the level of serotonin up we know exactly how these emotions correlate to the level of, of chemicals in the body but again we come back to the correlation there's no explanation as to how the chemical which is again a conglomeration of various unconscious matter atoms I don't know the exact chemical makeup of serotonin, but how that can give rise to what they call qualia, or conscious experience, when by itself it is an unconscious entity. So all we can say is, you know, these chemicals are here, serotonin makes you feel happy, so serotonin exists, something magical happens, and then we feel happy. And that's, that's the charmer's hard problem of consciousness. How does consciousness arise? How does awareness and, and feeling and sensing and being human how does that arise from fundamentally unconscious matter without some sort of magical intervention yeah because even if we dive into the quantum level everything in quantum level is still matter unconscious matter just at a very much smaller level so i don't know i think there is some background experience which is fundamental which can't be taken down into its molecular form because i think it's matter doesn't matter doesn't have the properties of to be able to create consciousness i think consciousness is a separate thing and i think it works through the brain in order to learn what it in order to gain the experience of being material why yeah. and what the mechanism is i don't know no, nobody knows it's it's speculation and that's when we get into the realms of philosophy because you know it's so far beyond the human being. I mean, even when we say about the near-death experience and the, the state of timelessness, if you haven't experienced it, to fathom what that must be like is... We can't. We can't fathom what it'd be like. It's beyond our human mind's capability to imagine. But all we can do, you know, is say, well, here's the data that suggests this hypothesis. This one doesn't work. It doesn't seem. So let's investigate further hmm. and go as far as we can. That's where I am. I might be completely barking mad. I don't know. But that's where I am. 